imagine what would happen if you suddenly decided to become a doctor. You'd spend the next seven to eight years having to absorb endless information on human anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, behavior, communication, alongside skills and applications all into your brain. That's what I decided to do. And between sometimes shitty lectures, cancelled teaching and worldwide global events, a lot of this learning has not actually happened in the lecture theatre or in hospital, but it has had to be self-taught. So as any other medical student, I have spent a significant proportion of my 20s just learning. And the single most life-changing skill I have taught myself is how to teach myself. So today I thought I would completely break down and show you the step-by-step -step process that I use to teach myself especially very difficult topics to learn in a way that makes them digestible, memorable, and above all, applicable and interesting. This will be a combination of my own personal experience, tips that I've gained from reading the books of the most excellent teachers in the world, and also a bunch of evidence-based research around the human memory, brain, and learning. Let's get straight into it. There was this general consensus that neurology is a very difficult topic to study, so for the purpose of this video I am going to break down how I would study one topic in neurology which is multiple sclerosis. So I have a six step process of which the very first step is called broadening the context and what I will be doing here is placing this topic in a broader context in the world and in my brain for it to make sense because at the moment multiple sclerosis is just a chapter in a textbook or some questions in my exam I don't particularly care about this. There's many chapters in many textbooks. There's no inherent curiosity in me to go, oh my God, I must know what this is about. And before you say, well, you spend a lot of money in university and if you don't study properly, then you're not going to pass your exams. This is not enough incentive for me to actually study things properly or care about the things that I study. So I need to place this in a broader context in order for it to make more sense and excite me a bit more. Words in a textbook, not exciting. Real life world, much more exciting. Richard Feynman, one of the best teachers in the world identified this phenomenon when he said, I have to understand the world, you see. So he felt very, very strongly that people have an inherent curiosity about how things in the world work. And this is what I try to leverage. Before I study anything that is difficult, I need to put my curiosity about this topic and my emotional investment in this topic at the maximum level it can reach. And at the moment, it's just non-existent. Multiple sclerosis, couldn't care less. So let's make it very interesting for Elizabeth. Now, the way that I will do this is that I will go to Google and I will Google multiple sclerosis and I will go to the news tab. But what I'm looking here is for some sort of media case. This is not going to be the studies of new drugs being found because again, I'm just not interested in this enough at the moment. This will be, is there some celebrity who has it? Is there someone who died because of it? Is there some huge controversy around this? Because I know that my brain is much more likely to kind of attach to these interesting things than it's to attach to a list of molecules, which I don't kind of recognize at the moment. So still, there's no textbook here. I'm just on Google and I am searching for um, something related to multiple sclerosis. And what I found, this is going to work perfectly. So this is a Guardian piece on Selma Blair discussing her history with multiple sclerosis. Ideal, absolutely ideal. I don't know who this lady is, but she looks like she's famous. So this is a famous person that I can identify the disease with. And what I'm going to do at this stage is that I am going to kind of read this and place it in my mind. If I just read about multiple sclerosis in a book, there's nothing that can connect it to pre-existing things in my mind because there's no slot for multiple sclerosis in my mind at the moment. There's something around neurology and yes, I can identify facts here and there, but if I'm just treating every single chapter as just random facts, they're all going to kind of disconnect at some point and not make any sense. So what I'm leveraging instead of my random science fact is I'm leveraging my curiosity and my understanding of the world in a much more layman sort of way, in a way that anyone would understand. And if this is written on The Guardian, I'm absolutely sure that everyone will understand. While I'm reading this, I'm going to be picking out things that stand out to me that I know that I can anchor to. Now what anchoring is, is connecting things from my pre-existing strong memory to things that are specific to multiple sclerosis. And I want this connection to be as strong as possible. So therefore this context is really, really strong. So let's have a look. She's describing her childhood. And I'm going to be picturing her every time that I read these things. So it says that she's suffered from multiple symptoms that come and go. Okay, so this is very interesting. There's a bit here about her going to Florida on a holiday and this is interesting because it's Florida specifically which is really warm I can remember that and then she was a 
trip for Instagram, so a paid influencer thing. She bought a tiny bikini and an Hermes shoes. Okay, very fancy. So they're on a yacht. Again, really strong imagery here going on in my mind. And what happened here was unfortunately when she was on the water, she couldn't move. Okay, so she jumped into off the yacht and then she was kind of paralyzed. She felt she was paralyzed. She couldn't control her limbs. She couldn't swim in the water. Okay, this is a very strong visual experience for me. Someone in kind of a tiny bikini and an Hermes uh, shoes jumping off a boat she probably didn't have the shoes on but in my mind um jumping off the boat into the sea cannot move okay this is very strong imagery good so let me move on so what happens is that yep she had a romberg's test okay um she ordered an mri on the spot she talks a lot about how no one had ordered her mris in the past okay oh again very very good there's a part where she speaks about using a cane at a celebrity event which again something quite rare that we don't get to see she was crying quite a lot unfortunately oh bless her interesting there are times when okay so there's times when both she pees the dog pees in the house and she pees herself because she can't so she probably has some urinary incontinence here okay interesting there's a lot of visual stuff here okay, so there was a lot of information here related to multiple sclerosis which is probably quite similar to the list of symptoms that i would be getting in a textbook but in this case they are being anchored to so many things in my brain so i'm thinking yachts i'm thinking salma blair i'm thinking canes i'm thinking dogs i'm thinking um peeing one's trousers i'm thinking um not be sometimes dancing sometimes not being able to move so there's all of these things i'm building a very strong picture in my mind and i'm anchoring it specifically to this individual so thank her so much for writing this article and i think there's a book on this somewhere so um this has mean that i've put this neurological condition into context now i'm going to be focusing on step number two which has to do with emotional implications and what this means is that if there is a very very challenging topic i need to make sure that i am fully emotionally primed to tackle this and what this means is that I need to understand the consequences of not learning it and understand the benefits of learning it and also try to convince myself or try to frame it in a way that I am genuinely itching to do this. This is the dopamine section of this um, study method. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter which is related to our anticipation of something. When we are anticipating something exciting, dopamine increases in our brain and we really, really want to do this thing. So this is what I'm trying to do with these sort of topics. So at the moment, Yes, I'm slightly interested in her story, but again, there's many stories out there. Why would I specifically want to learn about multiple sclerosis? So because we know that the scarcest interest is desire, we want to go for the desire angle here. So I'm going to go back to the article and see what is something interesting here. What is something about future me that might be interested? Is there something that particularly might make me kind of compelled to learn more? So, okay. I think the part that stands out to me the most was that she's been misdiagnosed her whole life. And especially there's this segment when she said, uh, when she got diagnosed, she said she felt an adrenaline rush of emotion. It felt like giving birth, the release of it. And I've gone through this myself. When you get a diagnosis for something that you've had your whole life and you suddenly understand what that thing is, it can be so, so, so absolutely relieving and life-changing. And it's such a bittersweet, but mostly sweet moment. And I can really relate to her with this thing. And so I don't have multiple sclerosis, but I can see how she must have felt in some ways in some capacity with her experience so now i'm emotionally invested now i know that this is one of those conditions that sometimes gets missed that sometimes is misdiagnosed that apparently some very few tests could have found so for her it was a positive romberg's test and an mri so now i'm kind of frustrated and emotionally invested yes i need to understand what the hell is happening here and why this is so important i hope you can see at this point how i have a very very vague clue about what this condition is but i'm already much more likely to remember details about it and also i'm much more likely to be emotionally invested in this topic a huge neurology topic which is just another chapter in my book i could not have cared less about now i'm like hell yes this is absolutely awful let's learn about it let's study more so now i get into part three of my study which is the deep dive and this is potentially the most controversial bit because the way that i study difficult things is by narrowing down on one specific thing that i need to know about them and then learning only about that and asking questions around it as and when they pop up so let me try to explain this specifically I don't do overviews because I find overviews tiring. Um, even if I'm excited about something, they make me bored about it. If I just read a whole chapter or a whole essay on MS, 
I couldn't care less. I will get bored halfway and I will stop doing this. But if it's one very specific problem I'm trying to solve, I can get super, super invested in like sitting down for 11 hours and going, how the hell do I do this? Because I don't understand it. So I'm leveraging my very intense curiosity rather than my vague, boring textbook understanding. So what I do at this stage is I think, okay, from all of these things that I've read about MS, what's one thing that just stood out to me a lot? And what stood out to me was kind of her saying specifically that, oh, I always have another pair of pants and sometimes I will urinate in my pants and my dog will urinate in the house because so clearly there's some kind of um, urinary incontinence associated with this condition, which is quite a curiosity. So I'm going to jump into the urinary incontinence and what I'll do from this day. So I still know nothing about MS. I don't know. I know it's something to do with nerves and the brain because it's neurology. I don't know how it works. So what I'm going to be doing at this stage is I'm just going to kind of Google signs and symptoms of MS and see, and then search this page for urinary incontinence just on Wikipedia. I'll do that. Okay. So urinary incontinence is mentioned there. It doesn't actually say where it's from so okay i'm going to go now to um another page on bladder incontinence again it doesn't have a lot it seems to be a nerve thing and i'm thinking okay why would the nerves get damaged and how are the nerves damaged so she has bladder incontinence because the nerves are damaged how are the nerves damaged now i'm curious about how nerves work and what's the issue in ms specifically so this is where i've reached my limits with all this like general knowledge um searches and this is where i'm going to start going into some very specific things to learn and this is for medicine strongly recommend the mcbi this is where i study most of my things i don't actually use a lot of textbooks but people will write like long thesis summaries on different different conditions so i'm just going to go on to this condition for um, myelination because I figure out I found out that it has to do with myelination okay so I read about myelin interesting what can happen when myelin goes wrong this kind of gives me an idea of what was happening with her but then I go with the urinary incontinence is that peripheral or central first I think okay it might be peripheral have a look nope it's not peripheral it's central so I'm like what the hell this makes no sense so then I'll go into deep diving things again and again so what I'm doing here is jumping a lot I go urinary incontinence hmm why is that oh it's because of nerves oh okay what's wrong with the nerves they're demyelinated what is myelin oh okay is it peripheral nerves or central nerves no it's only central nerves what the hell why is that the case so I keep on jumping back and forth from one topic to another topic to another topic to another topic all within multiple sclerosis but the key and essential thing is that these are all logical jumps that I am personally making this is how I am teaching myself I'm asking every question and I'm then finding the answers for those things which will then raise other questions and then I'll go answer those and this will take me from a woman peeing herself with her dog to me understanding the medical management of um, multiple sclerosis eventually but this whole jump journey will be very personal to Elizabeth where my interests take me what I'm curious about what I already know what I need to search and google this is all dependent on me so I'm self-teaching myself by using my emotional investment and my curiosity continuously throughout this process and this genuinely tends to be so much more fun and also so much more in depth in things than it would be just reading this chapter summary somewhere now I did say that this was slightly controversial and this curiosity jumping is basically based on many studies which say that you are much more likely to stick to a task long term if you are leaving it when you're not finding it interesting and jumping to another aspect of it and this is what Lufman and Becker identified when they said when I am stuck for one moment I leave it and do something else with this method I can work on different things simultaneously and I never encounter any mental blockages and this is what is super crucial with self-teaching I think you need to have a strong curiosity about the topic as a whole and then kind of flick from one thing that you find interesting to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing you will come back to the thing that you suddenly left when it becomes relevant in another point so rather than forcing yourself to just take in all this information without it sticking anywhere you can go to it as and when it becomes relevant and interesting going back to Feynman this act of what I consider almost playing around with a topic that I am learning is what he clearly identified when he was teaching himself and when he was teaching other people he said physics disgusts me a little bit now but I used to enjoy doing physics why did I enjoy it? I used to play with it. I used to do whatever I felt like doing. So this is super key for me too. I only study what I feel like studying, even though I'm technically forced to learn the topic. There's so much more freedom inside it that I can work with rather than what has been given or summarized by someone else. Now we get to point number four, which is questions or projects. Now this depends on the sort of topic that you are learning. If you are learning a more mathematical topic or a more physics topic, then I would potentially recommend going for
or kind of building a project with this or answering questions with it specifically. But if you're learning more of a medical topic, I would recommend going for answering questions on the thing itself. So even though I only have kind of an in-depth, very patchy understanding of MS, which is mostly driven by my curiosity and by the things that I read before, and it's not this like structured thing, I still don't want to go for the structure. What I'm going to do is actually try to approach questions with it. Because at this point, I've already been primed with a lot of things that I think are relevant, but now I want to see what the actual medics thinks is relevant and what will come up in, in my exam. So I'm going to find clinical case studies or I'm going to find clinical questions that are related to this condition and I'm going to try and answer them, knowing that I'm going to be very bad at answering them because one, it's the first time, and two, I don't actually know a lot about this topic yet still. But the reason that this is so important is because as I am answering questions, I'm referring back to textbooks and we're referring back to Google to answer those questions. So the process of learning things and the process of answering questions on this thing becomes interwoven. And this has been identified to be a very effective way to study. Sinka Avran said that experienced academic readers usually read a text with questions in mind and try to relate it to other probable approaches, while inexperienced readers tend to adopt the question of a text and the frames of the argument argument and take it as a given. So it's actually super effective to not have the reading and the questions as two separate things, but to interweave them together. Again, Sir Ahrens said that ability to use one own understanding is a challenge, not a given. It should consistently be challenging and it's fine for it to be challenging for you to actually recall things that you've just read or you've just learned. The very interesting thing here is because I've done a lot of priming and putting things in context, as I'm reading things on this condition, I can relate them back to the first case or the first article that I read. So for example, there's something in MS called Otov sign, which basically means that the signs and symptoms tend to get worse with heat. And this is where I remember, oh, when she went on this holiday and she was jumping off the yacht, so it was really warm, that's when her symptoms got worse. So again, I can relate the sign to the first clinical case. That's a connection that's much stronger than just another clinical sign mentioned somewhere. This process also serves as priming for other topics, other neurological topics, other things that I'm just kind of anchoring somewhere in my brain that I might come up with later as there'll be some things that are connected to MS and there are some things which will just be dead ends, but they'll remain there. There'll be things in neurology that will be connected to these in the future. The next step is step number five, which is the brooding stage. And this is a combination of familiarity and lack of familiarity with the topic. So basically familiarity is good, of course, because you need to be familiar with something to understand it, but familiarity can also be quite dangerous. As Bernstein recognized, there is a thing called the mirror exposure effect, which doing something many times makes us believe we have become good at it, completely independent of our actual performance we unfortunately tend to confuse familiarity with skill. So as I'm doing more questions and as I've been sitting on this, for example, a few hours, I might start to think that, oh, I grasp this when I really, really don't because there's a lot of other steps that I need to do. So what I do in this case is that I will brood on this. And what this means is that I will recognize that it will take me a lot longer than I think to absorb this huge topic. So I'm just going to let it rest, let it sit and do some spaced repetition. I'm not going to go into detail on this because so many other people have talked about it already. For example, some days, I'm just going to put it in my calendar. So when I wake up in the morning, I go, oh, let's think about MS. And I'll just think about it as I'm doing my makeup, for example, or as I'm walking to the tube station, or I might kind of remind myself of it before I go to sleep, just so some part of my brain kind of tries to refer back to it and see how much I can remember and kind of helps with those retention curves. Because as time goes, our retention or understanding of the topic becomes less and less and less and less. And having these little boop reminders here and there, either with questions themselves, or either just to prompt me to, oh, what do you remember about this topic or explain it or what was the case with Selma Blair, then um, I will try to kind of recall and make these retention graphs kind of go down a lot less than they usually do. So I'm working both with and against familiarity. I'm recognizing that it's a bit of a dangerous one, but that I also need to do it. So I keep both of these things in mind. And the last point is creating false deadlines. And this is what Kahneman identified as academic or nonfiction tests almost always take significantly more time than we expect to learn them. And every time that students and even professors have been asked how long they estimate will take them to finish a text or understand a text, they always, always underestimate this. So I keep this in mind that I will have this fake illusion of knowing what's going on, but it will take me a lot longer, but I will create some false deadlines in the meantime and say, oh, I should learn all of MS within the next two hours. And then I'm going to repeat all of MS in three hours in two weeks. So I'll create these false deadlines again and again, knowing that I'm probably going to forget most of the things when I get there. And that's absolutely fine. If you resonated at all with my way of teaching myself, something that does this for you automatically is brilliant. They use so many of the techniques that I mentioned earlier automatically in teaching you different sort of STEM subjects. It's absolutely 
mind blowing. I would really recommend even just trialing it out for a short while to see just how different it is to learn when you are basing things on real life examples and questions and making things interesting rather than the ways of learning and teaching that we are used to in normal life and normal school. I'm currently doing the questions on logic but there are some great ones on mathematics and also physics which I have tried in the past and are really entertaining and fun. There'll be a link in my description which will give you I think a 20% discount on Brilliant that you can check out or just look at it and see if it works for you. So yes that was how I teach myself difficult things that I usually would be too bored or uninterested or definitely struggling with grasping. This has been the method that I've developed for these special topics. I wish I had the luxury of time to be able to do it for everything that I study because I swear I would know so much more but it's just unfeasible. This is only for those rare things that are so challenging or so uninteresting to start with that I need to really really get serious with. Most of the things are just a combination of passively learning them somehow, doing some exercises here and there and cramming some numbers for an exam. So yeah if you made it so far thank you so much for spending this time with me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Be kind to yourself and others and don't believe everything you think. Thanks. Bye.